Okay, so yours, Michelle. Okay, well, thank, thank you, me. Brian. I, I very much appreciate this opportunity to um, be with you today and then with everybody who's attending. I appreciate your time very much. Um, uh, so my goal today is to offer a few pointers to everyone listening that will help you keep your book design on track. And um, what, what am I doing here? Everybody? Okay, can you see my screen? We just take a full screen. Okay, can you see that? Yeah, we can see it. Yes, it's a partial screen. If you can make a full screen, it would be better, but we, we can see it. There you go, that, that, that's, that's fine. Okay, good. Okay, I hate Thank technology. <laughs> okay, uh, so my goal today is to to offer a little bit of what I know about book design and bring up a few issues that book designers regularly think about. So it, it will help you keep your book design on track, whoever you work with, and I, so that you'll wind up with a market quality product that will get great reviews. So I'm going to start today with, um, well, Let's see, let me find my, okay, where, wait, wait, sorry. Okay, how do I get rid of this thing? There, okay. Okay, so I thought I'd start today with, with uh, it's gonna be a two part presentation. The first part about book cover design, the second part about book interior design. So I thought I would start with what is a book cover? How should it look? What makes it work? And then offer some tips for working with a book cover designer. Then I'll move on to book interior design and why it's so important in my opinion for your buyer, your reader, and also for you. And then I'll take your questions so that you can get what you want out of this presentation, not just what I want. So let's, let's begin. Yeah. What do I do here? Okay. Okay, so let's begin with what a book cover is. Your book cover is actually a package. It's more than a pretty picture and a title on top. It's a package that tells the world about your book. And we buy books exactly the way we buy any other retail product. Something about that package catches our eye. The largest text on the package tells us what's inside. And then the details convince us to spend money. So when we look at any package, we're asking ourselves one question, what's in it for me? Your book cover has to answer that question in about three, se three seconds. So that's a pretty big job. So where do we begin? How should your book cover look? The answer is it depends on what your book is about. Who's your audience? What exactly is it that you are selling? The answer to these questions determines the look of your book cover. If your book is fiction, you're selling, and I'm gonna look put up some bestsellers here as I go along. If your book is fiction, you're selling entertainment, intrigue, romance, adventure. The title and the graphics should pique the buyer's curiosity and hint at the story, but the cover design should never give away the story. We want your reader to imagine that the story is a good one and it's worth buying your book. There are different ways to do this. Sometimes the title dominates the design. Sometimes the image dominates the design. And sometimes the graphic and the title treatment are equally important. If you've written a nonfiction book, you're selling information. In this case, we want the buyer to know as much as possible about the book so that they can move toward that buying decision. So the title, the cover text, the graphics all set the mood and help the buyer to decide if this is the book they're looking for. Buyers usually know what topic they're looking for. So now it's a matter of helping them to choose your book versus someone else's book. So on the left, the anti-inflammatory cookbook for beginners gets straight to the point. It features 800 recipes and a 30-day meal plan. Both of those promises create value in the mind of the buyer. Surely some of those recipes are going to be good and a plan for 30 days to tell me exactly what to do. Great, I'm in. In the middle book, USA National Parks, a beautiful photo entices buyers with, a, with, a, with the desire to travel. And the promise of 62 parks is also a value creator because buyers know they can use this not only on this upcoming vacation, but on many, many more. 
and hilarious jokes for kids couldn't be more specific. The funny font and the bright graphics are sure to attract adult, buy <laughs> adult buyers and kids alike. Excuse me. Okay, what if you are the product? Then your photo belongs on the cover and the design should express something of your personality and a little bit about what the story is about. If you're planning a book series like this one here, which is the best-selling book series of all time, you should plan all of the covers before the first cover is designed so that you can make them all look, look good together, even if they're published over a wide period of time. So in these covers, the title treatment, the image composition, the color palette, each book is similar, but it also, each book is different, even though the fonts and the photos are different, it looks like a series. And if the word killing isn't enough, the dark imagery further tells us that these stories are not for the faint of heart. So all of these decisions on your cover tell people subliminally what your book is about. So once your manuscript is, is complete, you're no longer a writer, you're a publisher. You're the owner of a publishing business. So once you know what you're selling and who you're selling it to, it's time to think like a publisher. When publishers design a cover, they don't care what the author likes. They only care about what buyers are gonna like. Publishers always, always, always begin the book design process with research and you can do the same. It's easy to learn what the public likes. We need to just look at the bestsellers, what they're buying. So to get a sense of what your cover should look like, you can study best-selling books in your genre, look at upcoming releases from major publishers, talk to bookstore buyers, and find out what they recommend. Then share this information with your cover designer so the two of you can emulate the look and feel of these book covers. In this way, you can borrow bestseller credibility for your title. Because even when Amazon, when people go to Amazon and type in your title and find to find your book, Amazon's going to show the bestsellers right next to your book. So it needs to look just as good. In the business books above, the design is straightforward. The font's a classic. And what that does is it telegraphs the message to the business book buyer <clears throat> that, the, that the advice inside the pages is reliable. <clears throat> in these mystery and suspense titles, the colors are bold. The title type is in your face. It's not to be ignored. It kind of makes your blood pressure rise already just looking at the covers of these books. Now look at these religious and spiritual books. These colors are completely different they're soothing, they're peaceful. The design of these covers tells the buyer that comfort is within. So all of these decisions should be thought about before you start designing your cover. Once we, we have an idea in our mind about how the cover should look, we need to think about what makes the cover work with the cover text. Remember, buyers don't know a thing about your book yet. We have to tell them. We have to tell them what the book is about. Will it entertain them? Will it educate them? Will it help them solve a problem? If the answer is yes, they will happily send us their money. If the answer is eh, maybe, they'll browse on to the next person's book. So how do we tell them what we need them to know about your book? The title, primarily. Your title should be short and straight to the point. Short words and titles lend themselves to eye-catching design, and they're easy to remember and easy for you and others to say. In nonfiction, compelling titles don't always tell us enough. We need subtitles to support and explain the content of the book. So you should pack your title and your subtitle with keywords so your book pops up in searches online, even if someone is not looking for a book at that moment. Look at If you look at closely at these covers, you can see the subtitles contain an awful lot of keywords that are highly searched, and that is not an accident. Once you have the words down, then your cover design should have a clear hierarchy so the buyer gets the most important information first. Digital marketing, the one-page marketing plan, the seven-figure agency roadmap. Our eyes naturally go to the largest item on a page or the brightest item on a page. So unless you're already famous, your name should probably be a little bit on the small side. 
The cover design also has to capture the mood of your book. On the left, this cover tells us that we have a sad story inside. This cover in the middle tells us we're probably going to laugh at the content. And this cover on the right tells us that the classic, uh, the, the tranquil photo tells us that the story is probably sentimental. So we're often asked whether you should put, what other text should you put on the cover? Should you put endorsements or forward by or award stickers? My advice is to avoid clutter. If the names uh, of the person writing the forward or the awards are well known and recognized by everyone in the public, then go ahead and include it on the front cover. But lesser known people and awards can go on the back cover or inside the book. Too many messages confuse buyers and confused buyers don't buy. If the front cover has done its job, it pulls the buyer to the back cover or the online text. The back cover closes the sale. Every word counts. If it doesn't sell your book, don't put it on the back cover. Today, buyers don't want to read 700 words on the back cover like they used to. They want information and they want it fast. So we recommend 300 words max, a headline, a summary, maybe bullet points if your book is nonfiction, maybe a call to action to get them to buy it right now without hesitation. Should you put your bio on the back cover? It depends. If your bio establishes your authority to write the book, yes. Otherwise, put it inside the book. Don't waste back cover space with your picture or a repeat of the title and the subtitle. Use every square inch to sell your book. The spine of the book has one purpose, to be seen from a distance. So the spine design must catch the eye. Here's just a few examples. Sometimes we have a book that's too narrow to do much with the spine, but if you've got the room, put it to good use. Use as few words as possible, make them as large as possible, emphasize the important words, sometimes include a pattern. The front cover image can sometimes be wrapped around to the spine as well. So as you can see, there's a lot to think about on the cover. Your book cover is the destination of all of your marketing efforts. Every tweet, every blog post, every press release and will eventually lead buyers to your book cover. So you have one chance to capture and hold their attention and get it right. Fortunately, this doesn't have to be too frightening because it's what book designers do. And we love to help you with that. So my one piece of advice throughout all of this is please don't design your book yourself. In the next three slides, I'm gonna show you the contrast between do-it-yourself covers and a properly designed book cover. Now, before I do that, I want you to know I'm not making fun of the authors here of these books. They, I'm sure they did what they thought was best and followed the advice that you find online that a book cover is just something that you can do yourself in Canva, but the results are usually not up to market standards. So on this first cover on the left, you can see it has no emotion. The colors are drab. The baby isn't smiling. Why would anybody want to buy this book? The cover on the right is put out, of course, by a major publisher. It has a great title, a professional illustration, lots of primary colors, a childlike font. All of these things work together to make this a book that's very appealing and likely to sell. In these two examples, the do-it-yourself cover on the left fails in the typography department. The font is difficult to read and it's plopped on a, a really, really busy background. We have no idea what's going on. On the right, a major publisher put out the same title or a similar title about the same story. He understood that everyone knows the story. So an indistinct but still disturbing background is all that's needed to tell people what the book is about. Now, in this last example, the do-it-yourself cover on the left fails to con convey the correct mood for the book. The description on Amazon for this book calls it a heartwarming story about the rescue of a toddler. I don't know about you, that story doesn't look too heartwarming to me. On, on the right, the typography, the color, it, the imagery, the font, everything tells us that this book is filled with stories that are going to make us feel good. So, okay, so maybe you've decided you're not going to design your cover and you want to go out and hire a book cover designer. 
You have to be careful there too, because not all designers have the necessary experience. In the following slide, this slide and the following slide, I'm gonna put a before and after example. The left is what an untrained person might imagine the, a book cover design should be. We're not sure where to look because there's an awful lot of white space around all the elements. Then all the elements are far apart from each other. So our eyes don't really know where to go. The subtitle on, on the left is also very vague. Beyond diet, the complete solution for permanent weight loss. It doesn't tell the buyer anything much about the content. Every diet book says that. So the cover on the right uses the same color scheme, same photo, but it's composed so that all the elements support each other and the message is understood in one glance. In one glance. The subtitle on the right is also different. It contains four very specific promises, each of which will appeal to a separate group of buyers. Proven strategies, sculpt your body, heal your mind, become better today. So again, it's just something to think about when you, when you look at your designer samples. Oh, so forgot about this one. This, this example too, on the left and on the right, on the left, the designer didn't understand that we naturally look at bright elements first. So the first thing we see on this cover is a large empty space around the girl's head. And the least important words in the title told them they were, are also the brightest items on the page. So is this design just doesn't function as it should. The most important message, a guide to helping at-risk students is very tiny and it's at the top and it's almost unreadable. So the uh, um, book buyers already know what the problem is. The photo is all wrong. The, woman, the girl is unhappy. Book buyers already know the problem. They're looking for solutions. So the design on the right does a much better job of showing what the solution will be when you teach students that they are somebody. Okay, so now that we've gone through all of that, how do you find the right cover designer? One thing you need to do, of course, is review the designer's portfolio online, but don't just look at the portfolio in isolation. Open up two windows on your browser and compare the designer samples to the best sellers to make sure that the designer is working at that level. Next, you'll wanna choose a designer who specializes in book cover design. Creating a book cover takes a lot of practice and sometimes talented graphic designers who create beautiful brochures often cannot capture the look and feel of a book cover. And of course, you should check their reviews on Google and watchdog sites such as Ally and, and um, to find out what other people are saying about that designer. You can also Google the designer's name and with the word complaints to see if anything pops up. Another important point to consider is whether the designer is going to give you concepts or variations. What do I mean by that? Concepts are distinctly different designs that give you a choice in which direction the cover design is gonna take. These three covers are concepts. Usually one concept is chosen for further development. These two covers by contrast are variations. Now, variations are just minor alterations. They don't take very much time. So when you talk to your designer, prospective designer, you should ask them, are they going to do concepts or variations? And how many concepts are they going to offer? That way you'll know whether the price they're quoting is actually a fair price or not. So what do we all want when we hire somebody? We want no surprises, right? So designers are independent business owners who work in different ways. So it's important to clarify expectations in the very first conversation. Ask the designer about their rates, their turnaround time, how many revisions are included. Another good question to ask is whether or not they will provide you with full cover files for KDP and Ingram Spark. Every week we're approached by authors who found out too late that the answer to that question was, What's Ingram Spark? An experienced designer will put everything in writing. And if you have a deadline, please, please mention that in the very first conversation so the designer will know whether or not they can meet your objective. Okay, so now that we've got a good cover, we can move on to book interior design. 
It's not enough to have just a good cover. The interior design of your book is just important. It's important to your buyer, to your reader, and also ultimately to you. So what does in, in, uh, interior book design do for your buyer? Hopefully, it makes them say to themselves, wow, this looks like a good book published by somebody who knows what they're doing. I want to learn more about it. Your beautiful interior design should say, stop, read me. Don't browse away to that other book. We accomplish this through dozens of design decisions about everything in the interior of your book, including how words are paste, placed on the page, the fonts, the trim size, the binding, and the paper your book is printed on. So what message, whatever decisions you make or don't make, the interior design of your book will send a message. So we want it to match your buyer's expectations. In the following slides, I'm gonna put up again some more bestsellers to show you what I'm talking about. It's very important for your book interior and exterior design to look like what it is. This coffee table book is 12 inches wide by 10 inches deep landscape. The layout is open and airy. The fonts are classic. The printing is in full color inside and out. The design sends the message that this is a high value book, a coffee table book, perhaps a gift. This next example, the interior design is entirely different. It's a test preparation book. Eight and a half, eleven trim size. The two color interior, the use of heads, subheads, numbers, indents, and bullets help the students navigate through a large amount of complex material. And the wide margins give them room to take notes. The message that this design says, says is that it's easy to study. You're going to tell me what to do step by step to pass this test. Now, novels are an entirely different matter. In, in this book, the interior, most novels, the interior is black and white. The title page can briefly pick up on the cover design, but after that, the layout is quiet, quiet, quiet. We want the reader to have an easy time reading. The message we're trying to telegraph there is relaxation and escape. Every font you pick also sends a message. The correct font for your book is not the one that you like, but the one that's easiest to read. Can you choose a distressed font like one of these for a thriller or a mystery? Sure, just be careful not to overdo it because there's a very fine line between appropriate font usage and a design that is corny. Paper choices send a message too. A heavy glossy coated paper is often used in photo books, which are expensive to produce. And because the retail price reflects that, it makes sense to spend a little mix extra money on high-end paper that will make them, the photos pop and support the perception that the book is worth the price. If you're producing a black and white book on ordinary paper with photos, talk to your designer or your printer about the opacity of the paper. You don't want the photos on one page, one side of the sheet to bleed through and interfere with text on the other side of the sheet. Publishers everywhere want readers to enjoy the book and good typesetting is how we do that. Typesetting is becoming a forgotten word. I've been in the business 50 years. I never thought I would say that sentence. Now it's referred to online mostly as formatting, but typesetting is much more than formatting. Just like cover designers, book typesetters follow dozens of rules to ensure that readers are not distracted when they're reading your book. The first item we deal with are the pages. The book block is what makes a book look like a book. Everything lines up. The text begins and ends at the same point on every page. Now, this looks very easy to accomplish, and it would be if there weren't dozens of other rules to keep in mind at the same time. Next, we deal with the lines on the page. In book design, we have to avoid widows, which are the first line of a paragraph at the bottom of the page, and orphans, which are the first line of a paragraph at the top of the page. These two issues alone make maintaining the book block a challenge sometimes, and both of these issues will cause readers to pause for just a millisecond 
and it's enough to impede their comprehension. So that's why we don't like these two things. Next, we deal with the words on each line. Poorly justified text is another issue to be avoided. The top example shows a paragraph generated by one of the automated systems that are so common now. The space between the words on line two is much, much tighter than the space between the words on line seven. The lines of text are also kind of tightly packed together. So your eye wants to jump up or jump down instead of reading from side to side. The bottom example is the same paragraph set in Adobe InDesign. With the default settings adjusted, the space between the words is even, and a little extra line spacing keeps the eye going from left to right instead of up and down. You'll notice too on the bottom, the paragraph is nine lines instead of 10, taking up a little extra space and potentially saving you pages and printing expense on, on the book. After we deal with the lines on the page, we deal with some other issues that can crop up uh, with unexpectedly. So the first one here is called rivers of white. It occurs when word spaces just happen to align in an unattractive manner. This is make-believe text, of course, but the book designers will watch for and fix this when it happens. And typesetters will also watch for and fix ladders and word stacks. A ladder is when you have too many hyphens in a row, and a word stack is when words just happen to line up like this, one above the other. That too would be a distraction for the reader, and we never want the reader to be thinking about the type. We want them to think about your message. And last but not least, we typesetters deal with spacing within the letters of, of each word, which is why we have gray hair. The top example shows the word yesterday as it might be produced by an ordinary word processor or an automated system. If you look closely, you can see there's too much space between the Y and the E, and the other letters aren't spaced evenly either, and there's too much space between the end Y and the period. With a little extra care, the example on the bottom holds together much nicely, and it helps the reader read uh, without, again, without those distractions. Because when we read, our brain, our brain processes groups of letters at a time, not, not words. So uh, um, we don't want to distract the reader again. Now, none of these issues can be fixed in Word or in an automated system that a lot of people are using today. And that's why we always recommend that your book be laid out by a professional as well. Companies who offer these systems to authors are banking on the fact that you won't know about these things and you won't notice these things, but your brain will notice these things. And so will your readers. So it takes the care and attention of a book typesetter to make the text in your book look just so. Here's one funny final example of why typesetting is important. The page on the left here was formatted by the author in Adobe InDesign. As you can see, the table takes up the entire page. Uh, the page on the right, we recommended a little bit wider trim size, and we were able to set the table so that they we not only fit the table in its entirety on the page, but we got 12 additional lines of text on the page. Now, this book was chock full of tables. So this small decision on the trim size and on how the tables were arranged made a really big difference in the printing price. So to summarize everything I've said so far, your book design always sends a message. So we want to make sure it doesn't say, I'm self-published. Why? Because reviewers will know. They understand all the rules we just talked about, and they'll flag your book as an amateur production if they see any of these mistakes. Buyers will know. They may not know the rules, but they know when they're struggling to read, and they know quality when they see it. But most importantly, you will know that you made every effort to produce a great book and the pride of craftsmanship will, will show up in your smile, in your tone of voice, in everything you do to market your book. So I will stop talking now. If, you, if you'd like to learn more about us, you can contact me at the information below or visit our website where you can download my free book, Publish Like the Pros and get our newsletter if you so wish. 
And I'll be happy now to take your questions. Thank you very much, Michelle. It's great information. Thank you. We really had a lot of uh, great tips for us. So uh, we can, people can use the chat function to ask questions, or if you want to unmute, uh, just ask Michelle a question. We have a, kind of a small group, so we, we can work on that. But use that chat function either, either way. Um, from great presentation from Rita. Let's see. Uh, yeah, we had somebody had to, from from you who was on the call had to jump away, but thank you very much for the great information. Any other questions? I, I have a, I a couple you, questions. Here we go. Sure. Go ahead, Kathy. Um, yeah, I work with a lot of, um, uh, well, I would say a lot, but I, I work primarily with authors writing their memoirs. And many of them are older and want a book they can read. So mm -hmm. that always brings up some challenges because they'll also want them for other people. And so one of the challenges I have is having something that appeals to an older reader, but also, uh, you know, and that has to do with font size. I have an author right now who wants spacing between paragraphs. Mm -hmm. And so I'm always having to balance these kinds of things. Um, what I think looks like a professional book versus their wants and needs. And I don't know if you've ever encountered that and how you deal with it. I have I have some other questions, but that's my main one right now. Oh yeah, we get we get that with these issues all the time. And and sometimes the authors will just they it's really a distraction, right? If you put space between paragraphs, you're making the reader stop. It's just like putting a big stop sign there. An indent accomplishes the same thing. It tells it tells readers that okay, there's a new, there's a new subject perhaps happening here, but it's not as intrusive and it, it doesn't create as much of a brain interruption as a, a space between paragraphs. Um, so I, when I get those questions, I, I, I just try to remind the author gently that it's not about what their personal taste is, it's what's going to encourage reading. I'm sure you say the same thing. Um, and we want people to view, uh, to have a good experience reading, and not only that, to view their book as a professional product. Yeah, no, thank you very much. You're welcome. I, can I, I, if the, no one's asking, I, I actually have another question, if that's okay. all right. Oh, yes, please. I'm sure. worried that I chased everybody away. <laughs> no, no, this is really good, good information. Um, I, uh, a book I'm working on right now has a lot of, I mean, uh, again, you know, what, one of those challenges is dealing with what the author wants to get in the book um, because they're paying me as an editor, as a professional editor, but I also have to be, I'm not the same as a publisher who can kind of make um, some executive decisions. So there's a little bit of a, a balance that I have to walk. And in this case, I've got some content that um, I decided to put in boxes to kind of set it off because it's not part of the story. So there may be little stories. And this is a kind of practical issue because I, some of these go longer than a page. And then how do you do that without being so distracting? Or, or is that possible? Oh, I try to, you could, you could handle those things in two separate ways, right? When, when, uh, when, when the message is small and it will fit in a box that'll fit on a page, but but even even then, it is a challenge, right? Because what if that box winds up at the bottom of the page? Right. So so you know sometimes depending you you're writing memoirs, right? Yeah, yeah, these are memoirs. I have one that I'm working on that's it's kind of a hybrid book because it's part memoir and then the second part is really a motivational uh, book mm -hmm. that taps into some of the stories to to you know provide guidance and lessons 
Um, but again, I, there's an, there are stories that actually do support the book, but they, um, anyway, I've decided to put them in, in boxes and some of them are long and I, you know, and uh, I just kind of cringe when they go from more to, uh, we haven't, we got sort of a preliminary design, but uh, when they go more than a page, I just don't know how that's going to come across. Well, the, the issue really is whether that box can be relocated. Mm -hmm. Or does it have to appear exactly where? No, it's I think some. I think they're they they can it can be relocated. Okay, so what yeah. we'll, what we'll normally do when we use boxes is we'll put them either at the top of the page or at the bottom of the page, never okay. in the middle, never in the middle. And mm -hmm. if it's a long box that requires more than one page, we'll make sure that those they, that it falls on a spread, so you can see the entire thing. Uh, okay, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Yeah. So start it on a left-hand page and finish right. it. On right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. yeah. That's, that's... Another way to do that is to put the boxes at the, at the end of the chapter, mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. like tips. Right. There's, you know, it's it's hard when uh, what we'll do more than boxes though, because boxes are just another stop sign, right? Right. Right. Uh, so what we'll do sometimes is we'll just indent the text or use a different font. Mm -hmm. And just leave it where it is, and it's clear by the indent or by a change in font that it's a different thought. And right. if it and if it flows to the next page, it it flows, and you don't have to worry about it. Okay, great. That's thank you so much. You're welcome. That's some great comments coming in here. The Joyce Hick Joyce says it's great to see you in person, Michelle. Hi, Joyce. How are you? I don't see your mm -hmm. picture here. <laughs> Let's see. Uh, she may have gone off, but uh, there PJ, you are. <laughs> uh, Wade, very polished, a very polished and professional presentation from PJ Wade. Why my video doesn't stop? There you are. Hi, Joyce. There. Yeah, I would like to think of a good question, but you did such a good job with my book. I have nothing left to ask. <laughs> well, thank you. We always appreciate knowing that we satisfied you. Yeah, and it's uh, really selling too. I'm I'm getting ready to run some Amazon ads, but uh, uh, it's just been a thrill. <laughs> good, good. I'm glad to hear it's selling. Uh, yeah, I'm not going to uh, contribute to my retirement particularly, but um, it's, it's doing very well, very well. And well, you have to you have to talk to Brian about that because selling direct is a lot more profitable than selling on Amazon. Oh well, yeah. What I really need to do is schedule a book tour through the Adirondacks and hit every independent bookseller that I can find in the mountains, mm -hmm. tell them how they need this book set in the Adirondacks. But um, that would be quite an undertaking at this time of the year. So, have yeah. To... <laughs> we have a question here from from Rita. Uh, what about layout for children's books? I'm doing a layout for my first kid's book, and I'm learning that there's a whole other analog. Oh, yeah. Uh, what was the question? What about the, uh, uh, for children's books? Oh, the, uh, yeah. They're, they're a completely different category, right? So you want the, it depends on if it's a chapter book or a picture, picture book, which is it? Um, a picture book. A picture book. So okay. It's a picture book. Yeah. What? What? Uh, when? When we uh, do children's books, we 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 always love to meet the author before they have hired their illustrator, because the book needs to be planned. the The page count and trim size and so forth should be planned before the illustrator is hired. What What happens sometimes is uh, an author will come to us with illustrations already. And without having thought about the trim size and how the pages are going to break and whether or not uh, we have to deal with signatures, which is a, a page count divis divisible by four or eight or 16 pages. So um, if, if you are planning a children's book, hire your designer first, and then together you can plan the pages and what images and what pictures go on each page. And, and and wind and wind up with uh, the product that you envisioned. We we once had an author come to us with uh, landscape oh, wow. illustrations, horizontal, and then she found out that at that time, print on demand, no print on demand printer offered 
horizontal uh, landscape printing. So we had to just kind of make it work as best we could, but it wasn't what she originally had in mind when she hired her illustrator. That seems to have about covered, Michelle. If there's no more questions, unless anyone has any final questions for Michelle, please use the chat or just unmute and ask the question. Okay. If you can, if you can great, think great, of it. Great job. Great information. I will get the recording to everyone and then uh, to you, Michelle, uh, this evening and then everyone else uh, as soon as possible. Thank you, Brian. And thank, thank you. Again. Great information. Uh, thanks very much, Michelle. Nice job. Thank you. Good night, everyone.